Good morning, University Church family, friends, and guests. It's a beautiful day that the Lord has given us to commemorate towards his worship and his praise. We will, we, we will serve the Lord regardless. God is a good God. He's always good to us. And as we begin this day of worship and praise, we want to remember all of those loved ones in our family who are, who are blessed and who have been caused to be a member of God's family. I have these few announcements I'd like to share with you. Funeral services for Sister Louise Hewlin will be Friday, May 28, 2021. The family services will be May 28, at four o'clock to seven o'clock p.m. The, fam the funeral services will be at Cummings and Davis Funeral Home on Saturday, May 29th at 1130. The services will be at Cummings and Davis Funeral Home, 13201 Euclid Avenue. Sunday, June 6th begins our worship, return to worship within the church building. Our services will resume within the church edifice this mor with morning worship at 11 o'clock a.m. More information will be provided. I have these few announcements. Please continue to pray for Brother McLean's daughter, Kimberly McLean Hightower, Sister Nicole Bird, Sister Emma Brown, and family. Sister Dolores Bowden, who was returned to Cleveland Clinic. We want to keep them in prayer. And Sister uh, Emma Brown is asking for prayer for Sister Patricia Lathan. Please also continue prayer for Brother Harold Martin, Brother Paul Nelson, the Hewlin family, Sister Sharon Montgomery, her mother Peggy Jackson, her, her, her mother Peggy Jackson, her grandmother, and for her son Devon and her daughter Sasha. Brother Darren Stewart has, is in the hospital. He's experiencing complications. He asks for prayers from the church. Remember that the fifth Sunday will be on May 30th, 2021. We are still accepting and welcoming contributions towards our fifth Sunday operation. The Bible study books for the summer are now available. Please call the church office to make arrangements to pick up your book. Continue to keep all those who have lost loved ones recently in our prayers. Remember to pray for all our sick and shorty and brothers and sisters, their families, and all of those administering to the health and care of our loved ones. Also, please continue prayers for our leadership here at the University Church and the University family. Thank God. Our worship service from Psalms 136. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, the God of gods, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. To him alone who does great wonders, for his mercy and his loving kindness endures forever. Let us go to God in prayer. Prior to our prayer, we have on our on our roster this morning, we have myself, Brother Donald Nelson, the call to worship. Song leader, Brother Greg Shields, 
meditation and scripture will be Brother Douglas McHenry. Prayers, devotional prayers, Brother Amos Hicks. Sermon will be from, from come from our Brother Terrence McLean. Communion service, Brother Frank Barnes. Offering and announcements, I'll come back and, and, and ask, bless, bless the Lord for that. Our benediction will be given by Brother Raymond Knight and Brother Freddie Gibson will serve as our response facilitator. Now let's go to God in prayer. God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for this lovely occasion where you've called together your servants for the purpose of worshiping and serving you. You've given us the days of our lives, Lord. You've given us your blessings and your goodness. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, as we humble ourselves in worship and in prayer. Bless us as we offer up our, our hearts in, in worship to your service, as we receive your scripture, as we meditate on your word. Bless us, Lord, as we give into your offering. And bless us, Lord, as we commune with your son, Jesus the Christ. Bless us, Lord. Go with us this day. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. Good morning, good morning, Christians, wherever you are, help me, help me sing, uh, sing this song, sing this song. God is a good God, and that will never change. You know God is a good God, and that's why I call his name. You know, you know, you know that God is a good God, and that will never change. You know my God is a good God, and that's why I call his name. All right, all right, let's sing, God is a good God, and that will never change. You know my God it is a good God, and that's why we praise his name. And one more time, God. God is a good God, and that will never change. You know that God is a good God, and that's why we praise his name. Good morning, church. Please follow with me as we read our meditation, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shallow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A scripture reading for this morning's lesson. A lesson text is in the 102nd Psalm, verses 1 through 8. 
That's the 102nd Psalm, verses 1 through 8. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thy ear unto me. In the day when I call, answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke. And my bones are burned as an hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Mine enemies reproach me all the day. And they that are mad against me are sworn against me. I read in your hearing, according to the 102nd Psalm, verses 1 through 8. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, the doers, and hearers of his word. As we are led in prayer by Brother Amos Hicks. Oh, great and merciful Father, we come into your presence this morning asking forgiveness for our sins and giving thanks for the way that you sustain us. We must ever remember that you are God. You are the great creator. Without you, nothing was made. You watch over us each and every day. You give us our needs. You forgive us when we err. Father, we ask that you would continue to send your spirit to walk and talk with us, to lead us and guide us in the path of righteousness, to remind us that we are Christians and that we should be Christians each and every day, all day and all night. Father, we're are not just your people when we come into your building or gather together to worship you, but we represent you every day of our lives. We ask, Father, that we would do it in a manner that would be pleasing unto you, that the things that we do and say in the manner that we act will reflect on the fact that we call ourselves Christians. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless us to care for us, to calm our sick and our bereaved, to lift us up when our hearts are troubled, to guide us out of the path of the tempter. We ask Heavenly Father that we never forget the great price that your son has paid for each and every one of us, that we might have salvation. It's in his name of Jesus Christ that we pray for all things. In his name we pray. Amen. God has brought you through a storm. Join me in singing, singing this song. Singing this song. He's sweet, I know. Yes, he's sweet, I know. You know that storm may rise well and strong winds may blow well you know that i'll tell the world i'll tell it wherever i go i'll say that i i found the savior and he's sweet i know oh he's sweet i know yes he's sweet i know you know that storm cloud may rise 
stars, will and strong, winds may blow, well you know that I'll tell the world, I'll tell it wherever I go, I'll say that I, I found a savior and he's sweet I know, oh he's sweet I know, Yes, he's sweet, I know, you know the stone cloud may rise, well and strong, winds may blow, well, you know that I'll tell the world, I'll tell it where it is. Where I go, I'll say that I, I found the Savior, and he's sweet, I know. He's sweet, I know. I found a Savior, and he's sweet. He's wonderfully sweet, I know. We're thankful that God Almighty has blessed all of us with the opportunity to come together and to worship him uh, virtually in spirit and in truth. Again, we realize that it's God's amazing grace that has us among the land of the living. And for this, we are thankful. He has watched over us not only through the night, but throughout the week. He stopped by this morning, opened our eyes, blessed us to see the light of another glorious day that he's made. Not only another glorious day, but another Lord's Day. And we just want to say thank you to him. We are thankful to our brethren who have led us in our worship service thus far. Brother Donald Nelson, one of our elders, for ushering us into the presence of Almighty God. Brother Greg Shields. Uh, one of our elders for leading us in praises to God Almighty and reminding us just before the message how sweet uh, the Lord is. Uh, Brother Douglas McHenry for the meditation and the reading of the text and Brother Hicks for uh, ushering us into the presence of God by way of prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we look forward to Brother Frank Barnes, uh, our third elder for leading us into communion, remembering the suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus for our sins, Brother Donald Nelson coming back and helping us as we give according to how God has prospered us. And then another one of our beloved brethren, Raymond Knight, to lead us in a benediction from this platform, but certainly never from the presence of God Almighty. We are thankful to our elders ask you to pray for them and their families. Pray for our deacons. Brother Freddie Gibson will be taking the prayer responses on the teleconference call as he has been doing uh, throughout the past few months. And then Brother Anthony Slade, our, our second deacon, we thank him for all that he does uh, to keep the building functioning, opening, as well as uh, working along with Brother Bentley, Brother Rain, uh, Rick Winston, and others to see that our food giveaway continues to happen on um, the second Tuesday, I believe it is of the month. We know it's once a month and we're thankful to God for all that they do. Thank Brother Rick for uh, the technology, uh, Brother Ray Knight, Brother Kevin Edmondson and Brother Freddie Gibson. Uh, without them, we could not do what we are, are doing. For those of you who are members of the University Church, we're glad you're here. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time to worship God, declare what he's worth in your life. And we certainly are looking forward to the first Sunday in June when we can come back together uh, at the corner of East 89th and Chester and begin our assemblies in person. Uh, for those who are on the teleconference call, thank you uh, for tuning in via that. Avenue. And for those of you who are members of sister congregations, we thank you for being here. Uh, whether you are watching live, 
or whether you are watching it later on Facebook or you're watching it after it has been uploaded to YouTube. And that goes for members of the University Church family as well. Thank you. And for those of you who are not yet Christians, not yet members of the body of Christ, the Church of Christ, uh, the Church of our Lord that he's the head of, that he bought with his own blood, you are our special guest. Thank you so much for being here. Our prayer is that you will get the sense that we are a people who love the Lord and we love one another and that we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of, of peace. Uh, as we prepare to proclaim God's word, uh, our desire is always to glorify God, to lift up Jesus, that everyone will be drawn to him, uh, that the saints of God will be truly edified, built up in the most holy and precious faith, and that those of you who have not yet obeyed the gospel, that the Holy Spirit will take the word of God, convict you of the need of the salvation that's in Christ, and while the blood is running warm in your veins and you have breath in your body, that you will respond in humble obedience to the gospel of Christ, which is God's power unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But now we're going to look at the word of God, what thus saith the Lord. And I want you to turn to Psalm 102, verses 1 through 8. Psalm 102, verses 1 through, through 8. In the authorized King James Version, it says as a heading, a prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. And here's how the text reads. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me. In the day when I call, answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as an earth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Mine enemies reproach me all the day and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this text, I want to speak to us from the subject, when life overwhelms you, when life overwhelms you, would you pray with me? Gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this day and for the blessings of life that you have given us. We know that it's in you that we move and we live and we have our very being. And Father, we have come just to say thank you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. And if we're honest, we know that you have been better to us than we have been to ourselves. Our prayers that all that we have done thus far has been pleasing and acceptable in your sight. That this message will be in accordance with your will that all that will follow the message will be pleasing in your sight as well. You know my, my motive is to glorify you, to lift up Jesus, to edify the saints of God, and to prick the hearts of those who don't know you by the preaching and teaching of your word. I stand here not in the energy of the flesh, but in the energy and the power of your spirit. Use me as your mouthpiece. Thank you, Father, for all who are under the sound of my voice. 
And especially do we ask that you be with Brother Donald Nelson, one of our elders, who will be traveling to see about his brother Paul in Arizona. Uh, in a few days, we just ask you to give him traveling grace and to be with his beloved wife, Annie, and family. Uh, keep them safe. And may he know that you go with him because your spirit lives inside of him, that our prayers go with him, uh, that we love him as well as all of our shepherds and their families, the deacons and their families, mm -hmm. and all of the members and their wonderful families. Yes. Guide me now as I proclaim your word. Use me mightily. In the matchless, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and ask it all. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. When life overwhelms you, we have in this psalm a prayer offered up in the midst of desperate affliction. The afflicted are those who feel most in need of answered prayer. They are those who feel like getting an answer is a true long shot. But affliction makes them eloquent anyhow, and it is the kind of eloquence that moves Jehovah. Moreover, the fact that the affliction could be the result of our own sin doesn't really matter to God. God loves the cry of the desolate. This psalm is a psalm of affliction, and it begins with the cry of the psalmist asking that his plea come to God's attention in verse number one. He asked that God not hide his face in this time of trouble in verse two, and he asked for swift intervention. He says that his days are like smoke and his bones are like cinders in a cold fireplace, verse three. His heart has been cut down by a sith and withers on the ground, verse four. He loses his appetite in verse four. His skeleton has skin stretched over in verse five. He is lonely and deserted like an owl in the ruins, verse six. And he is like a solitary bird on the rooftop in verse seven. His enemies won't let up, verse eight. And his food and drink are ashes and tears in verse nine. His enemies do this to him, but God is behind it all, verse 10. His days are a lengthening shadow, and he is like crisp brown grass in verse 11. Psalmist is in deep trouble, and he knows he is praying to a God who isn't in deep trouble. God will endure, and he will be remembered always, verse 12. Because Jehovah is forever, the restoration of Zion is inevitable, verse 13. God's servants love her very bricks and show honor to the dust of her streets in verse 14. Not only will Zion be restored, the heathen and their kings will notice his glory there in verses 15 and 16. God will regard the prayer of the desperate in verse 17. This is going to happen and God's people will praise him for it according to verse 18. God peers over the balcony of the very highest heaven, and what does he be God down here? He sees the groaning of the ones in the dungeons, verses 19 and 20. These are the ones who, when delivered, will declare the name of God, verse 21, and all together they will praise him, verse number 22. God is the one who brought in this time of great weakness, verse 23. And the prayer is that God not cut him off in the midst of his work, verse 24. God's work is forever again in verse 24. And he is the one who created all things, verse 25. What he created will perish, while the creator himself will not, verse 26. Creation will wear out like a pair of old jeans while God is constantly the same, verse 27. And because God is constant in this way, the children of his servants will be like him and not like the created order, which will necessarily wear out, verse number, number 28. 
That's the entire psalm. I'm not going to preach all 28 verses, but wanted to give you that summary. So, so what kind of prayers touch the heart of God? Let me suggest a few of them to you on this morning based upon Psalm number 102, verse 8, 1 through 8. And the first thing I want to say to you is that God loves to hear a cry for hope. God loves to hear a cry for hope. This afflicted man sounds like he needs a good shot of hope. He feels that God has turned away. Verse 2, life seems to be rapidly flying past him and disappearing like smoke. Verse 3, he is in pain. He is sick and emaciated. Verses 4 and 5, he is weary and dreary and forlorn. Verse 6, he feels all alone. Verse 7, he feels attacked, threatened, and intimidated. Verse number 8. Sometimes we feel like that, don't we? Life passes us by and is gone before we know it. We become depressed and anxious under the stresses we are compelled to experience. We may feel that people are against us or don't like us or just don't care. And worse, we may even feel that God has withdrawn from us. Hope has eluded this man who was afflicted, but his faith seeks God and his cry does not go unheeded. At the conclusion of this psalm, he says in verse 28 in the New Living Translation, quote, the children of your people will live in security. Their children's children will thrive in your presence. In the midst of hopelessness, he has hope for a better day to come. In the midst of hopelessness, he has hope for security. In the midst of hopelessness, he has hope to be in God's presence. There is a song that is somewhat of a controversial song in, quote, contemporary Christian music entitled, What Could Be Better Than Hallelujah? Some of the lyrics in the song express a cry for hope from, from a tearful mother, a hopeless drunk, and a frightened soldier. Those lyrics say God loves a lullaby and a mother's tears in the dead of night better than a hallelujah sometimes. God loves a drunkard's cry, the soldier's plea not to let him die, better than a hallelujah sometimes, not all the time, but, but every now and then, life so beats upon humanity that you don't really feel like saying praise Yah. You really want to cry out in the midst of your tears, God, will you give me hope in the midst of this hopeless situation? God, what's going on right now? I don't fully understand. God, I'm hurting so bad. I can't even get the words out in my prayer. This does not minimize the desire for the importance of praising God, but it emphasizes the desire of a loving father for us to cry out to him when hope has fled. Let me illustrate trusting God for hope when it is most hopeless. It comes from the thispassingday.com website. It's written by Mark Broner, Bruner, and, and I like this little story that he talks about. It's been said that life's a camera. You wake up every day with one opportunity to take a picture of where you are going and where you've been. Depending upon where you set your focus, the picture can be blurry or sharp. We can choose to see life's quote, debts as a curse or an opportunity. It all depends on how we focus our lives. And then he quotes Jim Deloach. He says, writes Jim Deloach, some time ago I saw a picture of an old burned out mountain shack. All that remained was the chimney, the charred debris of what had been that family's sole possession. In front of this destroyed home stood an old grandfather looking man dressed only in his underclothes with a small boy clutching a pair of patched overalls. It was evident that the child was crying. Beneath the picture were the words which the artist felt the old man was speaking to the boy. They were simple words, yet they presented a profound theology and philosophy of life. 
those words were, quote, hush child, God ain't dead. Hush child, God ain't dead. That vivid picture of that burned out mountain shack, that old man, the weeping child and those words, God ain't dead, keep returning to my mind. Instead of it being a reminder of the despair of life, it has come to be a reminder of hope. I need reminders that there is hope in this world, uh, in the midst of all that is not lost, as long as God is alive and in control of his world. In the midst of all of life's troubles and failures, we need mental pictures to remind us that as long as God is alive, then God is in control. Deaths and life's troubles can be a very humbling experience. When you stare them in the face day after day, it is difficult sometimes to keep things in perspective. The fact is the temporal things of this life, the things that need to be bought, repaired and restored can easily become a source of hopelessness when we start each day focusing on the hopelessness that so often surrounds them. Eventually, the more we focus on these things, the more they become confining and overwhelming. Ultimately, they can rob us of our ability to trust and rely on the one who gives hope, even in the most hopeless situation. Jesus reminds us that when our hopes are being crushed, there is a blessing that awaits us when we temper our spirit in such poverty, reminding ourselves that a crushed spirit is the source of hope, the foundation upon which our faith is made stronger. This is a sharper focus, one that sees God clearly as alive in control and certainly not dead. That picture of that burned out cabin, that old man, the weeping child and those words, hush child, God ain't dead, is a reminder of hope. We all need reminders that there is hope in the midst of all of life's troubles and failures. We need reminders that all is not lost as long as God is alive and in control of his world and we trust him. It is often in our darkest times that God makes his presence known most clearly. He uses our sufferings and troubles to show us that he is our only source of hope. Are you facing a great trial? Put yourself in God's hands. Wait for his timing. He will give you hope that will not disappoint. Hope is not for the easy. It's also for the impossible. So God loves our cry for hope. And next he loves, number two, a cry for healing. Hear this afflicted man's cry from the New Living Translation. Verse three through five, he says, my bones burn like red hot coals. My heart is sick, withered like grass, and I have lost my appetite because of my groaning. I am reduced to skin and bones. Additional lyrics to, to that song say, we pour out our miseries. God just hears a melody. Beautiful, the mess we are, the honest cries of breaking hearts are better than a hallelujah. Physical healing is one thing, but inner spiritual healing is even better because the heart is healed. Isaiah wrote to rebellious Israel in Isaiah 1 verse 5, why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But the cry for inner healing and wholeness touches God's heart. And so the psalmist affirms elsewhere in Psalm 147 and verse number three, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Consider your need for healing this morning. Think about it. Where did you hurt? What has made your spirit ache? 
what has broken your heart? What has wounded you? In what way is your heart sick? Is it gangrene of a grudge? Is it leprosy of lust? Is it septicemia of selfishness? Is it cancer of carnality? Well, I start by to remind you there's healing with God. For the Lord says to his people in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse number 17, for I will restore health unto thee and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast saying, this is Zion whom no man seeketh after. The New Living Translation says a part of that verse, I will give you back your health and heal your wounds. Peter wrote concerning Jesus, the Christ, our Savior, our Lord, in 1 Peter 2 and verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And of course, he is not just talking about physical healing. He's talking about that spiritual healing that all mankind is in need of, a spiritual healing that is the result of our being dead in trespasses and sins. I read a story about a young lady that had a feud with her sister and nursed the anger in her heart. And in a few weeks, she began having headaches, insomnia, and weariness. She went to her doctor, an elder in her congregation, who gave her a clean bill of health physically. But this is what he said to her. Quote, your trouble is psychosomatic, resulting from some stress or unresolved difficulty. Can you think what it might be? She could not identify the problem, but promised faithfully to seek God's answer. She realized just then that she had been remiss in her prayer life. And so she prayed, Lord, if there's something in my life that drags me down, it makes me sick, reveal it to me. And that evening, she opened a dresser drawer and saw the picture of her estranged sister that she had hidden that and knew at once the cause of her illness. She found her sister to apologize and found a warm acceptance. No more headaches, and she slept like a baby. Her heart, which was hard, softened. Her spirit that was bitter, sweetened. And after she cried for healing, she could truly express her hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God loves our dependent cry for healing. And he longs to hear it. And then number three, God loves to hear a cry for help. This afflicted man's words echo helplessness. Psalm 102, verse 6 through 8, and the authorized King James Version reads this way. I... I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Mine enemies reproach me all the day and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. The New Living Translation reads like this, I am like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely as a solitary bird on the roof. My enemies taunt me day after day. They mock and curse me. This afflicted man feels like he is a victim of his unhappy circumstances. He feels overwhelmed and outmatched by those who hate him. What help is there for him and for us in those dire straits? God listens to fervent, honest, 
humble prayers. Someone has said, quote, listen, my friend, your helplessness is your best prayer. It calls from your heart to the heart of God with greater effect than all your uttered pleas. He hears it from the very moment that you are seized with helplessness and he becomes actively engaged at once in hearing and answering the prayer of your helplessness. Child of God, listen to me very carefully on this day. God does not turn away from those who seek him. God is for us. So who can be against us? The song suggests the state of helplessness, of facing death, of erasing shame, and of finding the right words to say in a prayer. The song says the woman holding on for life, the dying man giving up the fight. I'm better than a hallelujah sometimes. The tears of shame for what's been done. The silence when the words won't come. I'm better than a hallelujah sometimes. Amen. Admit it or not, we are all helpless in some way, sometimes circumstances and stresses and responsibilities seem overpowering and we are helpless. But I want you to remember the words of Jesus from the New American Standard Bible in Matthew 9, verse 36. Seeing the people, he being Jesus, felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. We sense our guilt and inadequacy to, to remit our sins. So the Bible says in Romans 5, verse 6, again, in the New American Standard Bible, we are helpless on our own. But while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. On our own. We are helpless to break certain addictions. But Paul wrote in Philippians 4, verse 13, again from the NASB, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Psalm 35, verse 9 and 10 in the King James Version. The psalmist says, and my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which deliverest the poor from him that is too strong for him, yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. In the New Living Translation, verse 9 to 10 of Psalm 35 says this, that I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be glad because he rescues me. With every bone in my body, I will praise him. Lord, who can compare with you? Who else rescues the helpless from the strong? Who else protects the helpless and poor from those who rob them? There is no helplessness when God is our helper. A little girl illustrates that. She wandered into a cornfield and was confused. She couldn't find her way out in her helplessness. She sat down and began talking to God. And she said, God, I'm lost and I can't find my way. Please send somebody to find me. Just as she concluded the prayer, her dad meandered through the field, picking a few ears, and he heard her prayer, and he became his answer. Mm -hmm. She felt helpless, but help was right there. Brother McClain, what are you saying? I'm saying that if you are a child of God, even though you might feel helpless, help is right there. Your heavenly father is hearing the prayer as you pray it, sending an answer after you have already started praying. He dispatches it from heaven because he promises that he would never leave us nor forsake us. When you have nothing left but God, then you become aware that God is enough. I'm convinced that over the past year plus, God has been reminding you and I that you don't have anything left, that the government can't solve your problems, that the government can't fix everything that's wrong, that they can't have enough money made at the mint to take care of your sickness and your death and all of the problems.
problems of your life. And now that you know that you don't have anything tangible that will last for eternity, you know now all you have is God. And now that you are aware that all you have is God, you also ought to be aware that God is enough. Listen to David's testimony. Psalm 18, verse 1 through 6. I, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be prayed. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me in my distress. I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. I want to remind you today all we need. God, in very truth, is my friend and my comforter. He is my companion and courage, my joy and my hope, my defense and defender, my provider and benefactor. He is indeed my anchor and assurance, my prophet, priest, and king. He who is all in all is everything we need. He is the personification of all that we desire, and we do well to know him in each of his glorious capacities. We do well to trust him in totality, in each of his multifaceted characteristics, for each is an exemplification of his being. Each is one glittering facet of his whole wonderful person. All I need personally, I say to you today, the Lord is indeed our helper. And the Lord, in one very special way, is my own personal helper. A Samaritan woman came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. The pleading father of a mute son cried, Lord, have compassion on us and help us. The daddy of the demonized son wept, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. The panicking disciple screamed out in a sinking boat, Lord, help us. Oh, yes. The Lord Lord responded with great compassion to all who sought him out for help. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You need to cry to him for hope. Cry to him for healing. Cry to him for help. And if you're sincere and humble, he will hear your cry. When it comes to this matter of salvation, there is no savior beside our Lord Jesus Christ. A few years ago, as I get my, my landing gear together, a man by the name of William Ernest Henley, who claimed to be an atheist back in 1875, wrote the poem Invictus. At the end of that poem Invictus, he says, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. In other words, he was saying that he didn't believe that he was going to fall into the hands of an angry God. He did not believe that he was going to have to give an answer to God about the deeds that he had done in this body, whether they are good or bad. He did not believe that there is a heaven or that there is a hell. He did not believe that there is a judgment to come, but I am so glad to know that the word of God says to me that Jesus said in John 14 that I'm going away to prepare a place for you that where I am, ye may be also in my father's house. So many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm glad that Jesus said in John 8, verse number 24, that unless you believe that I am he, he is who? He is the savior of the world, that he is Emmanuel, that he is the anointed of the father. He is the Lord and the Christ. He is the Messiah, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And where I am, you cannot come. You must believe that he died on the cross for your sins. You must believe that he was buried, totally covered up in that tomb. You must believe that he got up from the dead on that third day and said, now I've got all power in heaven and in earth. You 
must believe that he ascended to heaven. Yes. He's on the right hand of God, and one day he's coming back here again. I know William Ernest Henley, he didn't believe it, so he wrote the poem Invictus, but Dorothea Day wrote about 100 years later another poem that was based on his Invictus that she calls my captain, and she says, out of the night that dazzles me bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ the conqueror of my soul, since he is the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under that rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him, and here's the aid, despite the menace of the years, keeps on shall keep me unafraid. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared from punishment the scroll. Christ is the master of my faith. Christ is the captain of my soul. So today, if you're not a child of God and life is overwhelming you, I've just told you about someone who can take all of that burden off of you, who said in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Peter preached the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2 and told them about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he had ascended to the Father, he was on the right hand of God, and he had shed forth this which they now see and hear. And after they heard about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answered and said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Guess what? If you're being overwhelmed by life, that invitation is still extended to you in 2021, May 23rd, 2021. All you have to do is hear the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Mm -hmm. All you've got to do is believe it. I've already told you that, John 8, 24. But Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him being God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Yeah. I believe God is going to reward the faithful. Yeah. All the righteous in Christ. Are you willing to confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's son after you have repented of your sins? Repentance, Acts 17, 30, the times of this ignorance got winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And then after you've repented of your sins, confess with the mouth and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. He'll add you to his charge, the body of Christ, the family of God. And for those of you who are members of the Lord's church, and maybe you have fallen away, maybe you've strayed away from him. Maybe all of this that we've gone through this past year plus with the coronavirus pandemic has you overwhelmed. As the shepherds have already announced, we are coming back together the first Sunday in June. My prayer as I close this sermon is that we will reconnect with each other. My prayer to God goes like this. God, for many of us, this past year was filled with isolation. Despite technological advances, we watch relationships change and drift apart, and we grieve the loss. But God, we know you can redeem what's broken. You care about community. You created us for connection. And you also gave us your Holy Spirit who understands what we're facing and prays on our behalf. So when we feel alone, please remind us that you are near and that you're not done working. We establish our relationships and show us how to make meaningful connections, even if it feels uncomfortable at first. 
Ultimately, we want our loneliness to lead us closer to you and to the people that you've called us to love and support. So take our isolation, our disconnection, our social anxiety, and our fear, and turn it into something beautiful that draws the world closer to you and draws us closer to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. For those who are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're a Christian or not, remember that God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonderful. In the blood of the Lamb, there is power, power, wondrous working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wondrous working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wondrous working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. We want to thank God for the message on this morning. Uh, this is a time we have set, up, set apart to commune with our Lord and Savior, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And before my brother comes and, and shares some scripture, Standing to that, sing a verse, sing a verse of this song. I love the Lord, for he died my soul to save. On Calvary, his dear life he freely gave. From realms above, Jesus freely came to die, that I might live someday with him on high. I love the he has been so good to me. He gave his life from sin to set me free. No greater love than his could ever be. I love the Lord because he first loved me. Once again, we've come to that portion of our service where we have an opportunity to commune and remember of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 11th chapter, starting with verse number 23 reads, for I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, 
ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, allowing us be here to be here to commune in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you will bless the bread and bless the cup, and that those taken will do so in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. And the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy. This is the time of the service where we set aside a sum of, of, our, of our wealth to give back to the Lord that the Lord has already prepared for us and given to us. The Lord commanded that we come together on the first day of the week and give as he has prospered us. So let us prepare our hearts for this spirit of giving. In Luke 6.38, scripture records, give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. Not so much give so that it'll be given unto you financially, but giving is a spirit that God has given us that we give to him in obedience to his will. We further, further the gospel through our giving, through our finances. We bless the church through our giving and through our finances as God has blessed us. Now let us go to God in prayer for our giving. God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for financial wealth. We thank you for monies. We thank you for energy to earn monies so that we can support the offering in the church. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege and this responsibility. Help us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let us all say, Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Everlasting Father, we have rendered this worship service to you in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We have meditated on your word and quoted your scripture. Through your manservant, we have devoured a feast of your engrafted word. Our prayer is that we have done this in a manner that is pleasing to you. We are eternally grateful to continue to have the blessing to worship you in spirit and in truth. As we prepare to depart from this virtual worship, we ask for your spiritual guidance so that we may put into action the message delivered by your manservant. We pray that all who are in need of comfort receive the blessings you have promised us as long as we abide in your word. Continue to walk with us as we depart from one another because we need your spiritual guidance as we go about our daily lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. If you wanna know 
where I'm going, where I'm going soon. Yeah, if anybody asks you where I'm going, where I'm going soon. I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder to be with my Lord. I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder to be with my Lord.